Hi, good afternoon or good morning, depending where you are in the world, or possibly good evening um, if you're uh, dialing in from the Eastern Hemisphere. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Nina Hewitt. I'm the General Manager at the Institute of Construction Claims Practitioners, and you're joining us today as part of our public webinar series, um, which we deliver monthly. Um, and today we're delighted to welcome uh, Claire King and Rebecca Ardar from Fennec Elliott. So just going to give it a couple of minutes uh, to let everybody get into the room. Nice to see lots of people coming online already. I can also see we've got a lot of members and familiar names, so that's fantastic. Also have some new names, which is always good. It's nice to see that the uh, the word is spreading about the Institute and the, the webinar series is getting out there. So we'll just give it a minute or so and then um, running order for today, uh, a couple of announcements for any members online, a few housekeeping points, and then I'll be handing over to Fenna Kelly to lead us through the presentation. Questions for today, uh, you'll see on your control panel, you have a Q&A box. So please send questions through there. Don't send them through the chat box because I will miss them. <laughs> we tend to get a lot of questions during these sessions. So if you can funnel them all through the Q&A box, that just helps me uh, to sift through them and make sure we get through as many questions as possible. Okay, people are trickling in. Um, so I'd like to keep to the time today. So we've just hit the hour. So let's get started. Um, let me just share my screen with you all. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. And okay. Okay, so today's topic, uh, conditions precedent, will they bite? Um, I'll leave it to Claire and Rebecca to take you through the, the, the technical details and the summary of what we'll be discussing today. Um, but before we get started, a couple of uh, news for any members on the session. Um, steering committee elections, we are approaching the end of the year. It's time for a new member of the um, fellowship to join the committee. Uh, we've just put the ex uh, call for expressions of interest out this week. Uh, so fellows are, are volunteering and nominating themselves. If you are a fellow and you're online today, um, please put your hand up if you feel you can add something to the committee and would like to be a part of how we grow and develop and evolve as an institute. Um, members, the uh, nominees will be announced in uh, at the end of November and we'll be asking you all to vote. So please look out for that information landing in your inboxes. Just a heads up for next month's webinar. So we're alternating between technical topics like this one today and construction clinics. You may recall when COVID started, uh, we started a regular construction clinic, which is just a quick fire 30 minute Q&A. Uh, and now we're going to be alternating between the technical topics and the construction clinics each month. So. That'll be our webinar for December. Again, invitations coming soon. Look out for those. And if you have any questions, please make sure you join us. Okay, so on to today's presenters. Um, we're delighted to welcome Claire King. Claire is a partner uh, at Fennec Elliott and senior associate Rebecca Ardar. Um, Fennec Elliott specializes in construction and disputes, and they sit in the top band in both chambers and the legal 500 for construction disputes. Um, as a team, Rebecca and Claire specialize in domestic and international construction and, and engineering disputes, and they regularly advise in relation to the key standard form contracts across various construction industries. So I'd now like to hand over to Rebecca, who I believe is going to launch the slides and get us started with today's presentation. Brilliant. Thank you very much, um, Nina, for that lovely introduction. And it's a pleasure um, speaking to you all today. Um, so if we can just flick to the introduction, Rebecca. 
Um, in this um, talk, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what we're going to cover today. First of all, obviously, what is a condition precedent? What do we mean when we say condition precedent? How do we define it? What is the purpose of a condition precedent? And where do we find them in construction contracts? Next, we're going to look at when they will be enforced. So first of all, Rebecca is going to review some key case law on what determines um, if a provision is a condition precedent, i.e. it's mandatory, it has to be followed or not. And then I'm going to look at some more case law on notice provisions, um, time bar provisions, which is, I suspect, what a lot of you are particularly interested in and what determines whether they will be enforced. Next, we're then going to do a sort of um, review of key conditions precedents in various standard forms, which hopefully all of you will be familiar with. Um, the NEC, FIDIC standard form, focusing mainly on the Red Book, and then um, the JCT, and I've put a question mark there because arguably there's a debate as to whether it does have any conditions precedents in it. Finally, we're going to wrap everything together um, and, and sort of review what, what you need to be aware of um, when you're thinking about dealing with disputes which may have um, conditions precedents um, that are relevant in, in that dispute and hopefully give you some tips on um, what to look for and what to think of um, going forward so you don't fall into some of the traps um, that we see in some of the case law. So moving on to the next slide. What is a condition precedent? So a leading textbook defines them as a contractual stipulation that must be satisfied before a right or obligation comes into existence. Now, there are lots of different types of condition precedents. Um, for example, there can be condition precedents to an agreement coming into effect if you have a development agreement, um, for example, it may be a condition precedent to that taking effect that you have to get planning permission first, obviously planning permission being rather crucial if you want to develop a, a plot of land. Um, equally, um, you may have notice provisions uh, with time bars attached to them, but time bars are not the only um, condition precedents that you see. Um, as I'm sure you're all familiar, condition precedents are widely used in construction contracts um, and are seen pretty much in all the standard forms these days, both domestically and internationally. Um, notices are required, for example, for claims, if you're making a claim for an extension of time um, or associated loss and expense, you may have to issue a notice as a condition of um, being entitled to run that claim in the future. Notices may also be required for claims for adjustments to the contract price. Um, if you don't fulfill that notice requirement, you can't get an, um, within a certain period of time, you may not be able to get an adjustment to the contract price. And also in the dispute resolution process, there can be a series of condition precedents or gateways to the next step. Um, I'm sure lots of you are familiar with um, tiered dispute resolution processes. Um, you, step one, you may have to serve a dispute notice um, before you can go on to the next steps. Um, perhaps a senior management meeting has to occur within a certain period of time. That may itself be a condition precedent to then an adjudication, a dispute adjudication board, perhaps an expert determination. And finally, you may have to go through those um, earlier steps if you want to start court proceedings or arbitration proceedings. So they're very widely used throughout construction. And crucially, they are recognized as being a useful management tool when used properly. So what do we mean as a useful management tool? Well, the idea is that prompt notification of claims or issues allows the prompt evaluation of claims. Um, and that could apply throughout the construction chain. So a subcontract may have a condition precedent for notifying a contractor within a certain period of time. The contractor then can notify the employer in turn. 
the idea is that if a problem is identified early on, the parties can work together to manage the risks posed by the problem that's been notified more effectively. So delay, you can hold risk management meetings um, to try and mitigate the effect of that delay or work out how to um, minimise it as much as possible. So it isn't the critical delay that, that everybody's arguing about at the end of the job. Um, perhaps if a scope change or a variation has been instructed, um, if that is notified and the costs are much, much more than perhaps the employer ever realised or the contractor realised, then there is time to perhaps reverse that decision if you have to notify it and notify the costs associated with it before you begin the works. So essentially what condition precedents are used to do, at least theoretically, is to stop the build-up of claims throughout the job, starting from the beginning and ending with the classic final account dispute. So everybody is familiar with this. You get to the end of the job um, and some big issues still haven't managed to be resolved. Relationships start to break down because the stakes are much higher. The value of the claim is higher. Perhaps the delay is higher or, or claimed to be higher because it hasn't been managed in the way it could have been if it had been notified earlier. And positions just become entrenched. That is the classic final account dispute. And obviously, it is always healthy and a good thing for commercial relationships if it can be avoided. So the role of condition precedence is recognised by the courts in England and Wales and internationally, in fact. Um, for example, um, Mr Justice Jackson in the very well-known case of Multiplex versus Honeywell said as follows. Contractual terms requiring a contractor to give prompt notice of delay serve a valuable purpose. Such notice enables matters to be investigated while they are still current. Furthermore, such notice sometimes gives the employer the opportunity to withdraw instructions when the financial consequences become apparent. And I think it's really important for people to recognise that commercial role and the, what, the reason you have these pes pesky provisions of notification and time bars in construction contracts in the first place. This is not just to be difficult. The idea and the philosophy behind them is to stop people um, getting into disputes as because positions um, become more entrenched. It's about the management of risk. And that is a theme that flows throughout the case law. And I think it's something that people often forget um, when they're trying to argue around perhaps a condition precedent at the end of the job. So it's just something to be aware of and have in your mind as we go through this talk. So handing over to Rebecca. So as Claire has said, condition precedents can either act as the gateway to important contractual relief or provide a barrier to it. So how do you know whether the relief you're seeking is subject to a condition precedent? Generally, what you need to be looking for is a conditional link between the subject and the performance of certain obligations. So can you say that the subject is contingent on this performance? So long as the link is clear, it does not matter what wording is used to create it. So while the words condition precedent are often used, they're not necessary and that can lead to some confusion. If the words condition precedent are not used, it is still important to examine a potential condition precedent carefully, particularly in the case of a bespoke contract or amendment to a standard form. Just because they are not used does not mean you are not subject to a condition precedent. The stages of this examination follow the ordinary principles of contractual interpretation. So what is the ordinary meaning of the words? How does this ordinary meaning fit within the context of a contract as a whole? and so on. Something to consider in particular when moving to an assessment of the contract as a whole is where are these same words used elsewhere in the contract? If the same words have been used elsewhere in the contract to create a clear condition precedent, then it is likely that the repetition of these same words in the clause in question will be said to be demonstrative of the party's intention for this clause to also act as a condition precedent. This principle does, however, cut both ways. So by the same breath, if the words condition precedent, as an example, 
have been used elsewhere in the contract to create a clear condition precedent, but are not repeated within the clause you are examining, then this could be considered demonstrative of the party's intention to have the clause you are examining operate simply as an ordinary contractual mechanism rather than a condition precedent. The result of that would be uh, that failure to comply with that specific clause would be considered a breach of contract and potentially trigger liability for damages in the ordinary way, but it would not go so far as to extinguish a right to relief as it would have if the clause were to operate as a condition precedent. The courts have accepted that other words besides the words condition precedent do have the potential to form a condition precedent. These include shall be subject to or shall be conditional upon, but they often fail at sufficiently establishing a conditional link when the contract as a whole is taken into account. So this was the case in the case of Tallow and Heritage Oil in relation to the use of the words subject to. So this case concerns the payment of a 313.5 million US dollar tax by Tallow to the Ugandan government for its consent to Tallow's purchase of a petroleum exploration license from Heritage Oil. The tax was actually payable by Heritage Oil under the contract between Tallow and Heritage Oil. However, notwithstanding that, legally, under Ugandan law, Tallow was the party that would be responsible for its ultimate payment. Article 7.2 of the purchase agreement provided Tallow with a tax indemnity. Article 7.5 states that upon becoming aware of a tax claim to which indemnities under Article 7.2 may be payable, such as the tax that Tallo was required under Ugandan law to pay the Ugandan government, Tallo shall, under 7.5a, provide notice within 20 business days and, under 7.5b, take such action as Heritage Oil may reasonably require to defend or dispute the claim. So, was the 20-day notice requirement contained in Article 7.5a a condition precedent? The short answer is no. Uh, the slightly longer answer, which I know that you're all here for, is as follows. The court considered the long history of case law on this subject, and they acknowledged the generally accepted principle, as Claire pointed out earlier, Applying notice provisions such as conditions precedent assist with providing certainty to the party. So they are a useful management tool, but they also benefit both parties in providing certainty about the application and interpretation of the contract and their positions under it in relation to potential relief or liability. They can also result in a party losing a contractual right as a result of a trivial breach of contract, which otherwise really causes little or no prejudice to the other party. In light of this, they concluded, there is a general reluctance to enforce contractual provisions as conditions precedent. In this case, it found that the balance tipped towards this reluctance for the following reasons. There were clear examples of conditions precedent elsewhere in the contract, and the wording used in those articles was not repeated in 7.5a. The court noted that where no such wording is used, it is of marked and particular significance. It was relevant that both parties had the benefit of potential indemnities under the contract. This was important to the court because the reciprocity meant that both parties had an interest in ensuring that the benefit of this was preserved, particularly when it comes to an otherwise trivial breach of contract that resulted in little to no prejudice or loss. The fact that a breach could also be significant is not enough to regard the clause as a condition precedent. The structure and form of the article was relevant. In particular, Article 7.5a and 7.5b are linked by the use of the word shall in Article 7.5. It cannot follow that Article 7.5a, therefore, could be a condition precedent, and 7.5b is not. Notably, Article 7.5b would not be considered a condition precedent as it required reasonable action and reasonable requests. And the requirements to satisfy, satisfy this, along with the inquiries, resulted to ascertain whether they were satisfied indicates strongly that they cannot be a condition precedent. Notably, this is different to the approach in Aspen Insurance, where the fact that one contractual provision that 
formed part of condition four was not a condition precedent and that did not prevent another provision that formed part of condition four being considered a condition precedent. This case was distinguished on the basis that the provisions grouped under condition four in Aspen Insurance, despite them being grouped together, remained separate and freestanding, whereas there was a common link of Article 7.5, introducing both 7.5a and 7.5b with the same sentence, that made them both a continuation of that sentence. Therefore, they were both governed by the same word, shall. So when considering whether your clause is likely to extinguish a right to relief from practice, it is necessary to bear the following in mind. Conditions precedent are generally treated as limitation clauses, and therefore they need to be both express and clear in their intention to extinguish a right to relief. In Towergate, for example, the clause in question was able to be enforced on the basis that it was clear, grammatical, and workable. So there can be no ambiguity when it comes to the intended effect of a condition precedent. They may also be subject to the same considerations as limitation clauses, such as the reasonableness test in the Unfair Contract Terms Act 1977. You need to consider, does the commercial purpose of the clause in Aspen's case to allow the underwriters to investigate a claim at the earliest opportunity, justify the need for compliance with that clause? And does the, need, does the clause go further than simply being mandatory? Contracts are full of mandatory terms, that, that is their purpose. Breaches of these mandatory terms do not extinguish rights to relief generally, they purely give rise to damages as appropriate. So if the intention of the clause you're examining is to go further than this and extinguish a right to relief, then there is an argument that the clause should be so kind as to state this. What all of that can be so efficiently boiled down to is clarity is key. Or as Keating says, courts are unlikely to treat them as condition precedent to the making of any claim absent clear language to this effect. So I'll throw back to Claire now for discussion of when a notice provision in, a, in particular will be a condition precedent. Thanks very much, Rebecca. So when is a notice provision a condition precedent? And when we say notice provisions, we're pretty much thinking of time bars. So there's a key House of Lords case, House of Lords being um, the highest ranked court um, in England and Wales and Scotland, now called the Supreme Court, but this is the House of Lords before it became the Supreme Court. And the case of Bremer, 1978 case, laid down a two limb test for notice provisions. The first limb is that the notice provision must state the precise time and I've emboldened that for a reason because we're going to look at what precise time is later, within which the notice is to be served. And then limb two makes plain by express language that unless the notice is served within that time, the party making the claim will lose its rights under the clause. So you have two requirements there and both um, certainly from the Bremer case, um, seem to be very clearly, clearly de delineated. You have to be very precise. But moving on to looking at what is a precise time and subsequent case law. The case of Steria versus Sigma Wireless which is a more recent case, 2007, seems to sort of water down um, those two limbs. Um, now, it's worth noting that the Steria and Sigma case is not a House of Lords case. It's a first instant decision of the TCC, the Technology and Construction Court in England and Wales. So arguably, it's not, it's not a sort of... Um, good guidance as to the to the law on time bars as the House of Lords case. Um, but it sort of seeks to, to work within the boundaries of the Bremer case. So it's, it's you need to be aware of this case and its potential implications. So Stereo versus Sigma, what is a precise time? Well, Stereo versus Sigma suggests that a reasonable period 
may be precise enough for the purposes of the LIM1 test. So you may not need a specific number of days to be set out in your clause in order to fall within LIM1. And I'll just read out clause 6.1 so that you have a feel um, for what um, the clause said, because it was held to be a condition precedent. If by reason of any circumstance which entitles the contractor to an extension of time for the completion of the works under the main contract, or by reason of a variation to the subcontract works, or by reason of any breach by the contractor, the subcontractor shall be delayed in the execution of the subcontract works, then in any such case, provided the subcontractor shall have given within a reasonable period written notice to the contractor of the circumstances giving rise to the delay, the time for completion hereunder shall be extended. And if we just um, flick over, um, the court gave a number of reasons for this. So looking at the first paragraph, the court looked at whether the phrase reasonable period created genuine ambiguity. Um, if it did, if, it, if that phrase was too ambiguous, ambiguous even, to, um, to interpret for a court, then it's not going to be enforced. And this quote just sort of underlines that test. The principle which applies here is that if there is genuine ambiguity as to whether or not notification is a condition precedent, then the notification should not be construed as a condition precedent. Such a provision operates for the benefit of only one party, i.e. the employer, and operates to deprive the other party, the contractor, of the rights which he would otherwise enjoy under the contract. So any provision has to be clear, not ambiguous. So turning to the second paragraph, the court then held that reasonable period was not ambiguous. Um, which I, I think at the time people perhaps surprised at in light of Bremer, precise time versus reasonable period. But basically the court is saying, well, we can work out what a reasonable period is. We can look at the facts surrounding it and objectively obsess, uh, uh, assess whether notice was given in a reasonable period. That's our job and we can do it. So it's not ambiguous. So here the judgment judge is saying, in my judgment, the phrase provided that the subcontractor shall have given within a reasonable period written notice is a clear in its meaning. What the subcontractor is required to do is give written notice within a reasonable period for when he is delayed. And the fact that there may be scope for an argument in an individual case as to whether or not a notice was given within a reasonable period is not itself any reason for arguing that is unclear in its meaning and intent. So what the court is really saying here is in most cases, it should hopefully <laughs> be very clear as to whether notice has been given within a reasonable period or not. And most parties aren't going to have disputes on this. Um, in cases where they do have a dispute, then an arbitrator, an adjudicator, a court can look at it and work it out. Was this notice given within a reasonable period? So precise time requirement in Bremer is perhaps more relaxed than I think you'd think it was when you just read that case um, from 1978 um, out, out to yourself for the first time looking at it fresh. So that's something to bear in mind. And in terms of the express warning of non-compliance, Sterling versus Sigma also, um, and again, I say this is a TCC case, so we, we sort of need another case higher up the judicial rankings at some point, seems to water down the second limb of the test in Bremer. And again, it's, it's um, worth bearing this in mind when you're interpreting and trying to work out if your clause is a condition precedent or a time bar. So, I suppose the clearest wording you could have for a condition precedent or the legal boilerplate, which is the phrase the judge used here, is wording something along the following lines. Um, and X being a party will lose the right to bring the claim if it has not notified that claim within, I don't know, Y days, 10 days of the event in question. So that clearly says you will lose your rights if you don't do something within X period. But the, in, um, in Stereo versus Sigma, it was held that you don't need that sort of um, legal boilerplate necessarily, as long as it's 
the implications are clear enough. So the judge said, in my judgment, a further express statement of that kind is not necessary. I consider that a notific notification requirement may, and in this case does, operate as a condition precedent, even though it does not contain an express warning as the consequence of non-compliance. It is true that in many cases, see for example the contract in the multiplex case itself, careful drafters will include such an express statement in order to put the matter beyond doubt. It does not, however, follow in my opinion that a clause, such as the one used here, which makes it clear in ordinary language that the right to an extension of time is conditional on notifi notification being given, should not be treated as a condition precedent. This is an individually negotiated subcontract between two substantial and experienced companies, and that seems to be important here, and I would loathe to hold that a clearly worded requirement fails due to the absence of legal boilerplate. Now, don't get me wrong, if you're ever drafting one of these clauses or negotiating one, it's always better to make it clear what you mean and what happens if you don't follow the notification process. You are going to avoid disputes and silly arguments if you include that legal boilerplate, but following the case of Steria, the absence of that boilerplate is not necessarily going to be fatal to your position. And here, clause 0.6.1 was held to be a condition precedent. So when you're having arguments about these sorts of claims or you're looking at them, these condition precedents, it's worth having this case in mind. So moving on, just as an overview, um, condition precedents will be enforced under English law when they are clear and unambiguous. And the reasons for that is the policies that we, we, we've sort of covered earlier. So I just want to give you an example of this in the case of Glenwater versus Northern Ireland Water, because courts will enforce condition precedents even when there is a harsh result, even when it results in a significant claim being lost, if it's clear enough. So just to give you an example here, in this case, there was a 25 year old, 25 year old PFI arrangement for sludge treatment services um, in Northern Ireland, extremely glamorous contract. And you could claim relief um, if you first of all notified the CE as soon as practicable, and in any event within 21 days after you became aware of that CE, um, that, sorry, that that CE had caused or is likely to cause delay, um, a breach of obligations or the contract to incur costs. And then you also had to give notice with full details of the cost and the delay within 14 days of the first notice. So we're all sort of familiar with these types of provisions. You see them very, very increasingly often. So it was conceded in court that this was a condition precedent. So the question here was actually whether the notice had been given. Now this was court, court proceedings and there had been an adjudication beforehand. Um, and the court proceedings all looked at this sort of focused on this letter dated 20th of October 2019, which the claimant was desperately trying to rely on as a notice of this particular issue. Now, the problem was the letter wasn't actually that clear. There had been a lot of issues on this project and the letter dated the 20th of October 2009 related to a lot of other pre-existing claims, but didn't actually seem to notify a new one when you looked at it carefully. Um, and it was clear the parties had discussed problems, they discussed problems in relation to this, but that wasn't enough to say that there had been a sort of active notification of this claim within the relevant time limits. And another point that the court looked at was that this letter had come out in the court proceedings, but had not been mentioned once during the previous adjudication proceedings. So I think reading between the lines, there was an element of trying to squeeze something desperately into a box that it didn't quite fit in, fit into. And, and the court was very sympathetic to the claimants, but said this is a condition precedent and you haven't complied. And you can see the judge, what he said here, I do have some sympathy for the plaintiff's position because the failure to notify prevents a claim being made. And this wasn't, you know, I think it was about four million, five million pound claim. That may seem harsh when commercial parties anticipated a claim might come to pass. I should say that Mr. Brannigan did leave no stone unturned in arguing this case. However, I have to decide the case within the parameters of commercial and contract law. 
the contractual terms are clear and commercial certainty is an overarching consideration. The evidence as to the commercial context and surrounding circumstances has not remedied the defect in the letter. It seems to me likely that the notification requirement was overlooked amid a mass of claims and in the midst of an ongoing process of discussions. So two, two things to take um, away from this particular case. One, courts will, well, so in England and Wales, will enforce condition precedents even when there is a harsh result, even when a claim basically fails at the first step because you haven't notified it. And as a practice point, we all have projects where there are multiple issues going on at the same time. And at the time, you probably don't know which one is necessarily going to be the key issue at the end of the job that everybody then focuses on. Make sure you separately notify each one of those claims and do it within the relevant time limit. You never know which one is going to be the one that you need to have notified at the end of the job. So there are a number of lessons coming out of um, that. So just switching on to looking at some standard forms. Um, first of all, we're going to look at the NEC standard form before Rebecca turns to FIDIC. Now, clause 61.3, and I'm looking at it in the NEC 3 edition, because this is the one we are seeing, certainly in England, a lot of disputes over at the moment. Um, and this, this notification provision seems to pop up um, with alarming regularity um, and arguments to at it as to its effect are also <laughs> extremely common. So 61.3, the contractor notifies the project manager of an event which has happened or which he expects to happen as a compensation event if the contractor believes that the event is a compensation event and the project manager has not notified the event to the contractor. And this is the key bit coming up. If the contractor does not notify a compensation event within eight weeks of becoming aware of the event, he is not entitled to a change in the prices, the completion date or a key date unless, and these are the important exceptions that disputes often focus on, the event arises from the project manager or the supervisor giving an instruction, issuing a certificate, changing an earlier decision or correcting an assumption. So just breaking that down a little bit more. Sorry, can we go to the next slide, Rebecca? Brilliant, thank you. Um, the first question you have to ask, obviously, if you're having to squeeze yourself or argue around the time bar because you haven't notified within the relevant period, does the compensation event arise out of any of the following? An instruction, a certificate, changing an earlier decision or correcting an, an instruction. If it does, then it says in the clause, the time bar doesn't apply. Um, then you get into other sorts of issues. So for example, what is an instruction? Um, you need to look at the document that's been issued or relied on as being an instruction as a whole, objectively, what is it trying to do? Um, a document doesn't need to be labelled instruction in big bold letters and capitals to be an instruction. Equally, I've had this before, somebody labelling it, this is not an instruction, does not mean it isn't an instruction. Um, and it's amazing the number of times that people try and get away with that. Um, so the question that people have disputes, is this an instruction? Because if it is an instruction, it will fall within the um, exceptions to the time bar provision. Then you need to think about who needs to be aware of the event. Um, it's very unlikely that you're going to get away with arguing that somebody at the board level of a company in a construction contract has to be aware of this event before the time bar applies. But there may be levels of seniority within the site maybe you could get away with or, or, or argue about, something to think about. It's going to be much harder if there's a notification system um, or document management system where these things get issued to argue that, that hasn't, there isn't a sort of a date, um, certainly for an instruction where time starts. Um, for, if you've got an Aconex system or something like that, um, you may not, the awareness may be harder to argue about. Um, time starts from the event. Don't hesitate. Why wait? If you know something's happened, why wait the eight weeks? Don't do it. It's always it's always safer to just get on with it and get it done. However busy you are, 
if it's a significant issue, just get it out of the way. And then the other sorts of arguments we see, and, and this applies across all construction contracts, is um, waiver and estoppel issues under English law. Um, so what do I mean by waiver or estoppel? Um, well, waiver is where you sort of re vol voluntarily relinquish your right to um, rely on a legal right or a time bar. So, oh, don't worry, don't worry, we won't rely on the time bar provision. It's the classic example. Said verbally, where's the record? They actually said that. Or an estoppel where a party says, you know, you can rely on me not to do something um, or if you act in this certain way, we'll, we'll deal with it later. So these sorts of gentleman agreements, particularly at the beginning of projects, when sometimes people think that issuing notifications is, is bad for the commercial um, relationships, despite both parties putting them into their contract, contracts in the first place are something you need to be very aware of. So, you know, the classic, oh, don't worry, we'll deal with time at the end of the job. Um, we'll just deal with scope changes now. Um, or um, don't worry, we're all on the side, same side here. You don't need to worry about that. We'll, we'll let it pass. It's amazing the number of times you have arguments about there being a gentleman's agreement on site about how you are going to deal with this, which cuts across what the contract says, almost sort of a complete angle to it. Um, but then how do you evidence that later? Because, you know, with a cynical hat on, people can be quite wily about these things. They say something verbally, but there's no writing. There's nothing in writing confirming it. So these are sorts of issues that we are seeing on these sorts of clauses all the time, day in, day out. Don't fall into these traps. It's not worth it. Um, so just moving on to clause 10.1 in the NEC. Um, this isn't quite a good faith obligation, um, but it, it's pretty close. The employer, the contractor, the project manager and the supervisor shall act as stated in this contract and in a spirit of mutual trust and cooperation. Um, so how does that um, sit with time bars? How does that um, impact on the time bar? So you sort of get lots of arguments of that isn't fair with the time bar essentially it comes down to it does a duty of good faith or mutual trust sort of cut across that? What does it add, at least in English law? And we'll look a, a little bit at good faith in, in other jurisdictions later. So there's some helpful case law on the NEC three time bar, um, sorry, on, on the NEC spirit of mutual trust and cooperation obligations. It's not actually in the context of the 61.3 time bar. It's in the context of the dispute resolution provisions. Um, and in the particular subcontract, there was an adjudication provision and a time bar um, before you, you had to issue various notices before you could go on to the next stage if you wanted to contest it in arbitration. Um, and the judge said it does add a little bit of something. It means um, it would extend to a positive obligation on the part of the defendant to correct a false assumption obviously being made by the claimant. So if the claimant is assuming something or assuming that they're not going to rely on something and you don't correct that, um, then in those circumstances, this, this duty of mutual trust and operation, cooperation may get you over the line for a time bar. Sort of like a waiver estoppel point, really. It's very similar. Um, but it doesn't require essentially the defendant to put aside its own self-interests. So you can't you can't ignore somebody who's making an obvious assumption, putting that in writing and, and sort of asking you to confirm it almost, that they're gonna get away with. You can't ignore that, that would be a breach if you don't sort of correct a false assumption. But equally, if you just sort of keep quiet in the background and wait for time to expire, that's, that's, that's not going to be a breach of the mutual trust cooperation. The, the time bar is in there for a reason and you have to notify within the time periods. So in this case, um, the provision didn't assist um, Costain because um, Tarmac had not done anything which could have been seen as misleading in any way. So it, it, it didn't help, but it may potentially in some limited circumstances help, certainly under English law. So um, I'm now going to hand over to Rebecca to go through um, time bars in the FIDIC. 
Thank you, Claire. Um, so when it comes to discussing FIDIC, we are going to focus on the 1999 form. This one is still the most prevalent when it, when it comes to use worldwide, but also in terms of its consideration by the court. So it, it provides the most useful basis for analysis. The examples of the various condition precedents contained within the standard form uh, for employers claims and contractors claims alike are, are set out in the slide in front of you. Um, I've also included, and um, I am very sorry, I know that so far we haven't mentioned the current climate or used the word unprecedented, but I understand that force majeure and, and in particular force majeure notices may be on, on quite a few people's minds. So I've included those provisions on the, on the slide as well. Um, under the 1999 FIDIC form, force majeure is dealt with by clause 19.2 and that subject to a subclause 20.1 notice, the contractor could get time and limited money under clause 19.4. Therefore, consideration of subclause 20.1 is relevant when considering a force majeure notice under clause 19.2. Just be aware though that in the 2017 form, this is clause 18.2, though they do operate in, in, in similar ways. So when it comes to contractors' claims under Clause 20.1, it is necessary to discuss Abraskin. In this case, the FIDIC yellow book was used, though slightly amended, as the general conditions of contract between the government of Gibraltar and Abraskin for the construction of a new road and tunnel under the runway of the Gibraltar airport. The commencement date was 1 December 2008, with a time for completion of 24 months after that, so 1 December 2010. By October 2010, however, only a quarter of the works had been completed, so there were significant delays on this, this project. The contractor attributed these to unforeseen ground conditions as well as weather issues, which were, amongst other things, many other things, the issues dealt with in this case when it came to claims for extensions of time as a result of these issues. So under clause 20.1, a contractor is required to give notice of a claim for extension of time within 28 days of becoming aware of the event or circumstance giving rise to the claim. Failure to give this notice will result in time not being extended and the contractor losing the right to payment. So, did Mr. Justice Aiken had considered this to be a condition precedent? Although he did state that the clause should be construed broadly rather than strictly against the contractor, which does give comfort to contractors in, in some sense, it was determined that this sub clause does operate as a condition precedent. Subclause 8.4, which deals with the contractor's entitlement to an extension of time, and specifically the fact that it rises to the extent completion is or will be delayed. In light of this, the judge concluded notice did not need to be given until there is actually a delay, rather than a hypothetical or anticipated delay. While there is no particular form of notice required by the clause, the judge did not consider this to be fatal to its operation as a condition precedent and did note that by virtue of clause 1.3, the notice will need to be in writing. Further, in order to be considered a notice under 20.1, it will need to reference the fact that there is delay and make it clear that a, time, that a claim for extension of time is being made. So this does appear, as, as mentioned before, there is, there is some comfort here for contractors. It, it is a quite wide ranging interpretation. The fact that yes, this clause does operate as a condition precedent. Notice does need to be given, but this is not required until there is actually delay. And the only requirements for form are that it be in writing, that it reference that there is delay, and that it make it clear that a time, claim for extension of time is being made. These same principles are likely to apply for claims to claims related to payment under subclause 20.1 as well. Turning now to provisions for employers' claims, the inclusion of notice provisions for employers' claims with clause 2.5 is certainly also contractor friendly and is something that is less common when it comes to condition precedents within contracts as it acts to prevent an employer from summarily withholding payment or unilaterally extending the defects notice provision. 
So in particular, the employer does not have a general wide ranging right of set off. In terms of its operation as a condition precedent, this is discussed in NH International and National Insurance. So in this decision, the Privy Council considered whether an employer's claims for common law rights of set off and or abatement of legitimate cross claims were barred given they were not made in accordance with sub clause 2.5. The Privy Council noted the purpose of subclause 2.5 is to prevent such claims unless they have been the subject of a notice. To allow such claims without the employer <coughs> excuse me, having complied with the notice provision would render subclause 2.5 effectively meaningless. So the lack of specificity in relation to the time frame, they use the words as soon as practicable, did not actually prevent this clause from operating as a condition precedent. The Privy Council went as far as to say that where the employer has failed to raise a claim as required by the earlier part of the clause, the back door to set off or cross claims is as firmly shut as the front door of an originating claim. So as um, Claire mentioned with, with NEC and as we've been saying throughout, it is important that you simply just do not delay. If you are aware of an event that could potentially give rise to a claim, don't wait a certain time that you anticipate may either be reasonable under the contract or even if there is a time frame specified, don't wait for that to max out. We would say as soon as you're aware of the event, do give notice of it, as you do not know, particularly with these more vague clauses, whether they will in fact still be interpreted as a condition precedent and potentially that could delay could come, come to bite you. Notably, in the 2017 edition, subclause 20.3 allows the engineer to waive the time limit if the engineer considers that, in all the circumstances, it is fair and reasonable that the late submission be accepted. Though this does look like a way to argue around the application of the condition precedent in the event that there is a failure to notify, it is important to keep in mind that the circumstances the engineer can consider are limited to those contained within the subcause. Therefore, the application of this potential loophole is still restrictive and it should not be relied upon as a fail-safe. The best bet is always still timely notification of any potential claim. So now I'll hand back to Claire, who's going to talk through JCT. Thanks, Rebecca. So just um, whizzing through um, the JCT quickly. Um, this is uh, generally regarded as more contractor-friendly than some other forms. Um, now, the JCT drafting committee stated they did not intend notification of relevant events or relevant matters to be the subject of a condition precedent in, in the latest editions. However, notwithstanding that, clause 4.20.1 is sometimes argued, and we're seeing more and more of these sorts of arguments, to be a condition precedent. Um, and the wording, it is shall, it says shall, the contractor shall notify the employer as soon as the likely effect of a relevant matter on regular progress or the likely nature and extent of any loss or and or expense arising from a deferment of possession um, becomes reasonably apparent. Now, if you look at the stereo case, then um, maybe that reasonable versus or soon as is, 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 is accessible. Um, the court could assess it and shall is obviously sort of um, indicating it's mandatory, um, but the Bremer wording um, case would suggest it isn't. So it's just something to be aware of as well. Just get your notifications in. JCT 2011 a wording is different the way a word may is used. So there isn't really such an argument on that form. So sensible to notify sooner rather than later, the continuing theme of this talk. Um, and we see a lot of bespoke amendments imposing clearer time limits. So, you know, check your actual contract. Don't, don't assume that it's been unamended. So just wrapping up everything now, um, in terms of will they bite? So arguments to think about um, around conditions precedents, can you argue around them? And I've touched briefly on this earlier. Has there been some form of waiver or estoppel? Um, and I just explained what those were earlier, but in the City Inn versus Shepherd case um, in England, um, it was held that the time bar clause had been waived by conduct. So that contract required Shepherd to give details of the impact of an architect's instruction within 10 days of an instruction or lose entitlement to an extension of time. 
but representatives of City Inn were silent about the time bar at a meeting where the claims were discussed. And the court held that defenders must be taken bound to know the terms of their own contract. This is a Scottish case. So the wording's um, slightly eccentric in parts of it. The time bar clause was waived by conduct. There was no need to show there being prejudice. It was a fact they just sat by and stayed silent. It should be recognised that following, upon, following up on the meeting of, 8th, of the 8th of April 1998, the respondents continued for many months to pursue their extension of time claim based on gas venting instruction, despite the fact that had clause 13.8 been operated, such a claim would have been barred from the outset. So if you're acting for somebody at the receiving end um, of somebody mentioning a claim that has a time bar attached to it, there's always a danger in just sitting back and saying silent about it. What about the contents of the notice? Um, you need to be aware of what your notice actually says. Now, obviously, in the case we looked at earlier with Glen Water, the Northern Irish case, they're desperately trying in retrospect to, to argue that a not notice covered the dispute in question, covered the claim in question. In this case, which is a Hong Kong case, is actually the contractual basis of the claim that they're trying to argue doesn't matter in a notice. Um, so this is tunnels um, being constructed for the Hong Kong to Guangzhou Express. Apology if I've pronounced that wrong. Um, Bauer was a diaphragm wall contractor. And Clause 21 required two notices. Notice of intention to claim for extra money or time within 14 days. And notice within 28 days of the first setting out, and this is the important wording, contractual basis together with the full and detailed particulars and evaluation of the claim. Now. The arbitrator um, decided that the contractual basis of the claim did not need to be the same as set out in the notice. So things have moved on and they've thought of a new legal way of route bringing this clause under the contract. They've changed arguments between giving the notice and the arbitration. But the judge in Hong Kong held that was incorrect. They failed to pay heed to the express term, which included a statement that the provisions had to be strictly complied with. So this is a sort of contrast to the Brascan case. Um, it's a very strict approach interpretation. But the, the rule is really check what you'll notice. What do you have to notify? If there are various different ways you could bring this claim on a contractual basis, get notify everything. You know, you do not want to be in the position where you thought of a brilliant legal argument down the line, but you can't use it because it's not in your notice. Um, consider the governing law. Um, so just turn to the next slide. So um, obviously, I've been, we've been talking about English case law um, primarily. Um, another governing law may give you different angles. So good faith, for example, under Article 14 of the um, Romanian um, Code, take advice. Can you use this in a different way under that governing law um, to how English law would react to time bar clauses, for example? Um, the civil codes do normally impose obligations to act in accordance with the contract. So, so these are not get out of jail card free, but just obviously in each case you need to look and, and examine what, how does that particular governing law work with these types of provisions. Um, does the time bar comply with mandatory limitation or prescription periods which preclude shorter notice periods? Some governing laws have these. Again, check your governing law and what it says about condition precedents specifically. So conclusions, just drawing to an end so we can invite some questions. Um, always look at whether bespoke clauses are actually conditions precedent. Um, look at the case law. Is there any argument about it? Is there any doubt? Um, don't just assume something is or isn't. Um, there are case, there's case law on both sides of the coin and you don't want to fall down on the wrong side of it. Um, in English law, it is clear conditions precedents will be enforced when they're unambiguous. So why hesitate? Don't hesitate to notify. It's amazing how many times people do. Um, and there can be reasons for that, commercial relationships, etc. You have a contract for a reason. The courts will enforce it. Notify. Um, they are there for a reason, as I said. They manage risk and they prevent theoretically larger disputes in the long term. Gentlemen's agreements, very difficult to evidence in retrospect. In my experience, you're always looking for the killer email or the killer letter that confirms unambiguously that somebody is waiving their rights. It is often very, very hard to find because people are very careful and don't 
they don't exist. So don't fall into that trap. Um, label your notice clearly as a notice. This is a notice under clause blob. Just put it in the heading, makes it unambiguous. You are giving a notice. You don't want to be in the Glenwater trap and follow the contract wording. If you have to say what the contractual basis of your claim is, you have to put that in your notice. Make sure that you've covered everything you can think of, again, to avoid the Hong Kong case where it, you fall into um, the trap of having issued the wrong um, contractual basis at the end of the job. And with that, I think we turn to any questions. Thank you very much, Claire and Rebecca. Um, right, we do have some questions in, so uh, I'm going to dive straight in. Thank you for the very long-winded questions as well, everybody. Um, <laughs> oh, I haven't had a chance to look at these. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, if, uh, if Claire and Rebecca, if you've got your Q&A uh, box up, it might help me field them across to you in a way that's understandable. Um, but let me start from the top uh, and we'll work through. We are approaching the hour, so we'll just have a few minutes for questions uh, so we don't run too far over. Okay, so first question from Mohammed. Um, it's accepted that giving notice is condition precedent, but if a contractor fails and gives notice after the time bar ends, is this enforceable in court? And how does the court deal with such a situation? Um, well, um, the strict answer is yes, it, it is enforceable. Um, I suspect that a court, if there were any, you might face arguments about awareness and when you became aware of the event or whether you had to be aware of the delay caused by the event. And in, it, when you've got a one day you've missed it by one day, I suspect the importance of awareness, you know, becomes key. Um, but strictly speaking, if you've missed, if you, it's shown you were aware of something 15 days before and you fail to notify within the, say, a 14 day period time, then you're out of time. I mean, that is the nature of a time bar. Um, but I suspect you'd be getting into the weeds and looking at awareness and all sorts of things and a lot of detail to try and argue your way around it. Okay, next question comes from Steve uh, related to JCT. So under the JCT 2016 forms, uh, design and build and SBC, I'm, I'm Claire, you might have to clarify for me what that yeah. means. Uh, the notice obligation under clause 2.27.1 2 is that the contractor shall forthwith give a notice upon it becoming reasonably apparent that any event relevant or not has occurred. Does this act as a condition precedent if the contractor does not comply with the requirements and thus would lose any entitlement to an EOT inset of the lack of express wording to suggest it does? Um, the, the short answer is there is a debate on this. <laughs> um, I don't think there's any binding case law that I'm aware of on it yet. The drafting committee said they didn't think it was a condition precedent. Um, but the wording in the stereo case would arguably suggest it was. So I think always, and we've seen arguments and adjudications about whether it is a CP or not. Um, so I'm going to deliberately sit on the fence here. I don't think there's any binding case law on it, but um, it's always safer to notify. That's that's the reality. Um, you know, don't hesitate. Just Just get that notice in. Okay, question uh, from Christian, moving on to FIDIC 1999, um, in relation to subclause 8.8, .8, suspension. According to the FIDIC contracts guide, it states that the notice under subclause 8.9 does not refer to the time limitation of subclause 20.1 due to the slight change in language, as it doesn't say notice in accordance with subclause 20.1. Should the same wording in other notice clauses not be construed the same, as for example of subclause 13.7, adjustment for changes in legislation, which states that the contractor shall give notice to the engineer and shall be entitled subject to subclause 20.1? Yeah, it's not great wording that, is it? Um, it does cause confusion. We actually had this question before in very similar form. I, the thing is, 8.9, says and shall be entitled to subject to subclause 21.20.1 20 contractors claims to now subclause 20.1 20 
says it's, a, you know, it's been held to be a CP and here is a provision referring to it. Now, the guidance note may say one thing, but I would suggest very strongly that it's much, much safer to act in accordance with clause 20.1 because I, I think there is a risk that that is held by cross-referencing to clause 20.1 to have a time bar in it. And I think that's a very real risk. So I would just notify again. Okay, next question from Eddie. Um, let's say a notice for time needs to be served within 28 days after the delay event first arises and the contractor missed this notification period. But as the delay event continues to involve, the contractor then serves a notice on let's say day 40 and argues that his notice is still within time in the sense that, that, in the, sense that the delay event first arose on day 12 and thereby concedes his entitlement for any delay from day one to day 12. Would you agree with this logic or not? Rebecca, do you want to, do you want to take this one or I don't mind taking it either? Yeah, um, just, I'm swallowing up all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. I, again, I think this is similar to the first question that Claire answered and in, in that it would turn to awareness. And if the clause were to be instructed were to be interpreted strictly and imply, applied as a condition precedent, then you would be looking at when the parties first became aware of that delay event having arisen that could, could potentially give way to a claim. Um, so I, if they can successfully argue that in fact their awareness of the, of the event did not arise until day 12, then potentially there is, is some leeway there. But it will depend on the wording of the clause in question and the circumstances factually as to whether they would get away with that. I think, um, as, as with all of the answers, the, the real takeaway is just to notify as early as possible to, to avoid that issue. Okay, um, all right, question from uh, EA Tan. If the contractor failed to comply with condition, condition precedent for their claims for time and cost, can the employer still benefit from their default for not granting the extension of time and benefit from their default uh, imposing delay damages? Um, well, the short answer is under English law, yes. If you if there is a very clear condition precedent clause and you have an ob obligation to notify within a certain period of time and you don't, um, you have signed up to that. Um, and in those circumstances, yes, is the answer. Um, yes, the employer effectively gets away with it, but they get away with it because you haven't issued your notice. And the argument would be f from looking at the court's logic. Well, you've denied by not notifying it to the employer you've denied them the opportunity to get involved and try and mitigate that risk or to try and help it or or manage it in some way so it's become more of an issue because you didn't notify it in the in the time period so that is the commercial sort of risk management purpose of these clauses and certainly under english law they will be enforced so you're not you're not going to be in a circumstance as well. The LDs magically fall away and are a penalty because you fail to comply with your time bar. Under English law, and I have to emphasise English law, <laughs> um, that wouldn't happen. Um, it may be that different jurisdictions take a different attitude to that, um, but under English law, you'd, you'd be stuck if you if you hadn't notified. Okay, and one more question um, from Hassan. Uh, sometimes there are time bars for serving notices and the contractor fails to serve a notice within the time bar period. However, in some cases, there is sufficient disclosure of the event in the related project records and thus the client is aware of the event. In this case, how does the court approach the failure of the contractor and is the time bar and notice provision still enforceable? Um, well, interesting one. Under the NEC, if they've got awareness or if it's sort of an, an instruction or, or something like that that's caused this event, then you may get around it. Um, there may be some sort of waiver or stopple point if they actively know about it. They sat in meetings where it's discussed, but sort of sat on their hands with time bars when, when notices have been mentioned. So there may be something in the project records you can dig out to try and use as a tool to get around not notifying. Um, if, if there's evidence that they're 
you know, ultimately an employer is allowed to stay silent. They don't have to point this out to you, but they're not allowed to actively mislead you, certainly under English law. Um, and I, it's just that balance. It depends on the facts again as to where that line is. Have they waived their right to rely on the time bar or is there an estoppel that you can use based on the documents and based on what happens? Um, you know, looking at the mutual trust obligation in the NEC and that, that case again, um, it, it, it's, um, sorry, I got thrown by another question came in that distracted me. Um, it, it, it's the level of the obligation not to mislead. So if you don't have a mutual trust obligation, maybe saying silent may, may be, and just maybe um, easier to get away with than if you, you don't, um, if you do it's it's just fact specific unfortunately but there are arguments i would start i'd look at all the project records and try to work out if i could had an angle there essentially also it depends on the the wording of the contract some are some are quite specific as to form of notice required whereas others are not so if you do have a more vague contract that just requires on a on an undefined notice then then potentially in say a monthly project report, you could argue that the sufficient criteria had been met, you know, notification of a delay event, the fact that the program will be pushed out. Um, you just need to be aware though, say take the FIDIC form, for example, um, notification as part of that, while it is a vague notice, the fact that an extension of time will be required is, is a requirement. So sometimes general project records won't be sufficient to comply with that. Yeah, that's a very, that's a really good point. And, and yeah, trawling through the paperwork is um, often attempted by us <laughs> retrospectively, let's put it that way. Um, oh, last question. Is that contradicting with common law and contract act under English law and law? Or doesn't it? Do you mean, I think, do you mean the sort of mutual trust, good faith obligation and how that sits with English common law? I, I'm not I'm not quite sure. Hope, hopefully you do mean that. Sorry if I answer the wrong question. Um, I think the answer is it, it doesn't really. Under English common law, you always have the waiver and estoppel points. So that's sort of an ethical. Um, yes, a party of default cannot benefit it. No is the answer because you're in default as well for not serving your time bar notice. Um, the, co the co courts look at this as if you, you're both grown up entities, you've got a major contractor and a major employer, and you're building a power station, you're very grown up people who are signing up to an agreement that abides by its terms. And the rationale for doing this is to try and manage the risk as soon as it occurs. So I don't think they see there being a conflict. Um, if there is evidence, as I said, of, of massive wrongdoing, or, or saying one thing and doing another, you know, oh, you'll be fine, don't worry about it, just get on with it. And that's in writing and there's enough evidence of it, then the court will be very reluctant to enforce something like that. And you're looking at waiver and estoppel arguments. But in the absence of that, they're gonna look at the wording of the contract. And if it's clear and unambiguous and you didn't act in accordance with it, um, then fairness, you know, it doesn't really come into it. You've agreed to something in the contract. You also have to consider that it's, um there is a balance between, obviously, if an extension of time does not need to be granted and the contract milestones therefore do not move, the employer may in some way be benefiting by that default by obtaining the delay damages. But the counter argument to that would be that the fact that delay damages are even claimable is because they are losing the benefit of mm. receiving the works as at the date of the contract milestones, which have been missed. Yeah. So, for example, a power, they're not getting the pack, they're not getting paid for the power they're meant to be producing, or they're not getting paid for the water they're meant to be producing, or the steam. You know, there's a whole sort of series that there's a whole network. It's not just under your contract, it's, it's other contracts as well. Okay, well, great, great Q&A session there. Um, thank you very much for all your questions and, and equally for your responses. Um, I hope that everybody got a lot of value out of the session today. Um, notices come up again and again throughout COVID and I guess this year, um, which has become the year of webinars and, and online CPD. Um, there's been a lot of sessions uh, specifically on notices. I, I know that Fennec Elliott also started a webinar series this year. So if you're interested in, in this topic and others, please do check out their webinar series.
the ICCP ran a series of public sessions. Um, we have a, a session on notices across FIDIC, JCT and NEC. We also did a session on variations, um, all of which is up on our YouTube channel. So if you're not following us on YouTube, please do and subscribe and you'll be notified when, when these uh, webinars go live and, and are posted. Um, equally, this session will go up on there today. Um, sorry, not today, sometime over the next week, but this session will go up there. Um, and last uh, month, uh, Andy Hewitt with the ICCP also did a session on notices, uh, which will be going up soon. So there's lots of content out there if you want to dive more into this topic. Um, no more announcements from, from the ICCP specifically. Um, I'd just like to say thank you again to Claire and Rebecca. It's been a pleasure to, to have you today and, and thank you very much for giving us your time and for sharing your knowledge uh, with our member community and also uh, members of the construction industry. So thank you very much and we'd love to welcome you back soon. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Bye bye. And we'll see you again next month and look out for those construction clinic invitations and get your questions in. Um, we always get great attendance to those sessions and lots of questions. There's tons of uh, valuable content in there. So hopefully we'll see you next month. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks.